Yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation and the opportunity to, to speak here. As I said before, it's now 20 years that I've been to Irvine and really enjoyed it a lot. Now, today I would, yeah, I would try to give some overview of work on, on image reconstruction and also discuss what kind of everybody um, has in mind nowadays, how to use deep learning, does it make sense to deep learning and what are the what are some pitfalls when doing that? So, okay, this is the slide for more the practitioners, usually not for the mathematicians. Um, I think the mathematicians, in particular people in inverse problems, are, are clear with that uh, image reconstruction is, is one of the most important steps in the uh, imaging world. And if you do some stupid things there, if you lose information, then all these deep learning, whatever tricks that you do later to manipulate images can usually not restore them. So we need to put a lot um, um, of effort into that. And there is a strong demand also from the practical side on developing better and better methods for reconstruction and for uncertainty quantification. And this range is really from yeah, nano to macro from uh, yeah, different Earth to, to different planets. So even in, in Mars missions and in astronomy, you have the same kind of problems. Let me just give you two types of problems um, that I've been concerned with recently. So one is in a very general way, emission tomography, which you can do in an active or passive way. So the basic idea is always to indirectly detect photons that come from a, a radioactive decay and then try to get some kind of directional information. So either if you have two photons, you try to have a coincidence information that you know the radioactive decay was on the line between them, like you have in PET, or you build collimators like inspect, so to only filter those in a certain direction. Or um, there is recently a, a lot of effort on what I would call energy-based things. So for in particular using the Compton effect. So I give you here an example of what we are doing very specially in Germany. We have a project where we build a Compton kind detector to image the radioactive pollution in nuclear power plants. As you might've heard uh, last year, all the nuclear power plants in Germany were finally shut down. And over the next two to three decades, there will be a need to do imaging and to monitor how much radiation is left there and to, in the worst case, at some point um, say, okay, then you can tear down the remaining parts of the, of the power plants. Okay, another thing that I'm particularly concerned with now in Hamburg where I moved to last year is nanotomography and imaging from synchrotron and free electron laser sources. So there, depending on how far you go to the sample, what kind of optics you use, you want to do um, a phase retrieval problem with well different kinds of forward models. And in the future, more and more people don't want just to do the classical like diffraction patterns, but you also want to do this in a tomographic way, which poses a lot of uh, challenges to inverse problems, both from a modeling point of view, from an analysis point of view, since the tomography problem gets quite nonlinear, you cannot use the logarithm trick like in conventional CT anymore. And also, if you do it on modern synchrotron sources, and we all even want to build a much larger one in Hamburg, then you also have an enormous computational problem because the image size and the size of the tomograms are massive and even you, it's even a problem to store them even on, on, on parallel computers to, to do this computation. And so in my group, we deal with all these kinds of things, also different uh, kind of problems in the Helmholtz Association so and this, as I said, goes from, from nano imaging to microscopic imaging and from yeah, all planets nowadays. So for example, one thing 
we were concerned with was also terahertz imaging for, for a mass robot. So you find these image reconstruction problems basically everywhere in, in, in the world and in the universe, I would say nowadays. So from the classical point of view of doing image reconstruction, you would go from the first image to the last one and say, okay, I have an unknown image, I have data, and then I solve an inverse problem. So I solve kind of an equation. And in the in the worst case, somehow people are doing that. They just solve some linear or, or nonlinear equations with off-the-shelf methods and then see what they can get. Um, if you go into the modeling or into the detailed mathematics of it, there is actually much more what happens. So the big box that I would say is here is, is what I would say is the, the core forward model. So the main physics of the image formation. So like the Radon transform in tomography or wave equation models for, for optics. Um, so this is somehow produces an image that um, yeah comes from from the ideal physics. In practice, there are, however, a lot of things going on. And what is, of course, well established is to, to deal with noise. So then you don't have perfect data and also to deal with sampling and in some applications also with some kind of, of undersampling. Um, that's not all you have to deal with when you do image reconstruction. There are some other issues that come in. There's something that I would call prior degradation. So if you do, for example, medical imaging, then unfortunately, patients, they move, they breathe, their heart is beating. So that also changes kind of your, your imaging model. So objects are not in the right position when you image them and change during the acquisition process. Um, also in, in nanotomography, it's very hard to exactly see um, what, where the probe is. It's also difficult to exactly uh, characterize illumination. So there are things that kind of before you take the measurements already um, go wrong. Then of course, your, also your core model is a model. So by definition, a model is, is never correct. So there are model errors, there are additional uncertainties that come in that you have to take into account. And on, oops. What is now something wrong? Okay. On this way back from the data to the image, you also, of course, want to use some kind of, of prior knowledge. So either in a deterministic way or in a, in a Bayesian way, I would say in the past, we were mainly using some kind of structural prior knowledge so that images are reasonably smooth and we regularized by things like TV or other things we can analyze. Nowadays, we want to use more and more data-driven models. How are typical images looking like? What can be used and, and use that into, into the data? And then in the worst case, you can even have additional things going on, which are not in the core format model, which are maybe a bit related to the prior degradation or even more. So you could have additional physics going on while you take um, data. So you could, for example, again, have motion or you could have some tracer which is um, doing some kind of enrichment some physical processes um, while you take imaging data and in a modern way of imagery construction of course this is not just one simple equation that you have to solve there's a lot of building blocks that you have to put together and which in a modular way you can exchange between many inverse problems so for example the noise if you take if you count photons, you can always do this with Poisson no noise. If you can't have uh, some electronics, there are ways to, to model that nicely with Gaussian additive noise and so on. So depending on what, whatever you do, whatever um, application field you're after, some building blocks may be very similar. Some of these may be very specific to, uh, for the application. Okay, so if you formulate this, as an inverse problem, so what you usually do, this is what you probably all know, know, you derive kind of the ideal physical model of the forward operator. So this is kind of a map between function spaces. Then you should also derive a statistical model of the noise. And then 
you derive some model or some data about what are the favorable solutions, what are the typical images and structures you expect to see and maybe also you want to see because in some applications you don't care about certain things. So if they're reconstructed badly, you, you don't matter, but you want to see certain things. Okay, and of course, the natural way to do this is kind of the formulation is a Bayesian model, as a posterior model. So you write the probability distribution so that if, if you have given data F, that U is your solution of the inverse problem given by the likelihood, the probability that F would be the data if you have given the image U and the prior probability um, of the image. And then you have to normalize by a prior probability of the the data, which is yeah, usually a normalization that you don't care about too much. And ideally, in, in algorithms, you don't have to take into account. So um, in a sense, the likelihood comes from your forward model and your noise model. This is the way how your physics goes into. So this is physics plus statistics. And then the prior is kind of something you very often in Wayne, so over many years, this has been kind of an art, what would be the prior for a certain certain model, okay? Um, and it's of course very difficult to come up with, with a prior. Um, so how would you translate typical properties like I want to see images of a human torso into a mathematical probability or into some functional and the relation to functionals comes when you look at specifically point estimates. So the most popular ones in imaging are, are map estimates. So you take the maximum of the a posterior probability or equivalently take the negative log of it. And then you see a, a relation to what is often called variational regularization. So you will have the likelihood term, which is kind of a data fidelity between uh, your forward computed data. So if K is a linear or nonlinear forward operator and your measured data F, and you have the prior probability, which you can translate into the regularization functional in the invariation of regularization. Okay. And just to give you some examples how these building blocks uh, matter in the reconstruction. Let's do um, yeah, a little bit of, of PET imaging. Um, here is an example of radioactive sugar in a human heart. I always show you only 2D projections now for, conven for convenience. Naturally, a PET is a 3D imaging technique, so all the reconstructions are really in, in 3D, but it's a bit difficult to see things from 3D. Um, so, the first thing is what is the effect of improving forward models? So the simplest forward model in PET is to say, okay, I have a radioactive decay on, on line. So I randomly sample line integrals by the photon count. So I have the Radon transform and sample it with Poisson noise. So if you reconstruct with that, you get the image on the left. If you also add that you have some scattering effects, not all photons go straight in the detector, uh, you slightly improve the image. You see already a slight sharpening of the result. And then there's another thing which is even more severe in the modeling. Not all photons make it to the detector at all because some of them are attenuated. And in particular, the ones from the middle are more strongly attenuated than the ones close to the boundary. And if you then reconstruct the image, you see a quite severe change in particular in the left ventricle. This is where in, in this case, the, the doctors would be interested in. So you see improving forward models can always make an impact. And you may say, okay, for me, the images look the same. If you present this to a cardiologist, then you will have very different conclusions than um, from the original image. Okay. Um, Another thing, another question is what happens with the noise statistics? How important is this and how important is the regularization? So we did one study here many years ago 
to, to demonstrate what are the effects of different um, noise models and regularizations. So there we looked at radioactive water, which is very challenging because it don't collect many photons. And so the expected kind of the Poisson noise model is, is important. And also the regularization is important. And you see this immediately, of course, if you don't do regularization, like in the left image, then you just reconstruct rubbish. If you uh, well do what many practitioners do, some kind of EM-based iterative reconstruction and smooth the image a little bit. Well, it looks like something, but it's still far away from um, what you want to have. If you do a good regularization, and I would say 15 years ago, TV was kind of a standard, um, but you use a wrong noise model. So you just use these squares. So in a sense, a Gaussian noise model. Uh, then you look, you reconstruct something that looks nice but which has nothing to do with with what you expect so it, you completely over smooth everything and then if you go towards the right noise model so there are gaussian approximations with non-constant variance of the poisson model or on the right really a poisson noise model you see a dramatic change and then you start to see the the ventricular structures again in the in the heart that you want to, to re, um, reconstruct in this case okay and so the classical way we did was to look at model-based regularizations, and many of them were motivated by either harmonic analysis or by PDE. So simplest idea, if you look at, well, maybe the trivial inverse problems in image reconstruction is, is to do denoising. Um, and so basically, you want to reconstruct something where you penalize noisy structures, which means, for example, gradients, and you start with the simplest idea to penalize the gradient of the image squared, which is, of course, the easiest thing to do in computations. Then you would end up, if your ground truth was the right image, you end up with something like the image on the left. And of course, you see this over smoothing of the edges. And you may say, Okay, in an L2 sense or in some appropriate measures like um, PSNR, it's not so far from the truth, which is actually the case here. But the problem is if you present this to a human eye, then everybody would say, okay, I don't want to see that. It's like going to the optometrist and having the wrong glasses. You would always ask for something sharper typically. And the problem here is that all what you learned in PDEs and all what was really cool in PDEs, for example, elliptic regularity theory works against you. So in this case, if you regularize with the gradient square and you look at some optimality condition of, can be some arbitrary data term where you have a function of KU, uh, then you see that at least the negative Laplacian of the image, which is the derivative of this functional, will always be in the range of some adjoint operator for the forward operator. And typically, the adjoint operator is a smoothing operator. But even if the adjoint operator is the identity in L2, then you get the Laplacian in L2, which means you have H2 sobel of regularity, which means in 2D, some Lipschitz or some Helder regularity. So this is what you see, you don't get sharp edges, okay? Same happens with the pillar plush, and, and then the basic idea for many years was to say, okay, the only thing where we break the regularity is um, P equals one. So you go to penalizing by the total variation. So formally the one norm of the gradient, if you want to do it rigorously, you define it in the usual sense by um, duality and then you can check the optimality condition. Okay, if the first term is differentiable, you get the derivative of the data fidelity, and then you get basically the divergence of some vector field G, which corresponds to a normal vector field on the level sets of the image. And the nice thing here is that you don't have the um, um, image to be smooth, you just have the normal vector field to be smooth from this condition. So you break this 
very strong school system. And that's what you then see in reconstructions. Uh, can make it even better with a uh, lot of techniques like TGV, where you also use a little bit of the norm of the second derivative and do some infimal convolution. And then, oops, why does that work? If you do it right, you can see this. What, what happens is you can really advance the, the imaging in practice. So on the left, what you see is the standard clinical protocol that people were doing in, in PET typically. And they were taking 20 minute measurements and they were reconstructing with a very simple method with um, some expectation maximization algorithm. And they got the images on the left. So when we developed our methods, we thought, okay, then we can use much more noisy data. More noisy data for Poisson measurements means you go to data from a much shorter time interval. So the initial idea was to go to five minutes instead of 20 minutes. Um, okay, the students didn't listen. They went to, to five seconds and we still got very good reconstructions. So then you can really improve things. And then there are two things where you can benefit. One thing is that the, the typical MD would think of, so the radiologist would think, well, if I can measure five seconds instead of 20 minutes, I can have much more patience in my expensive scanner and I can earn much more money. So this is the kind of math that radiologists can do very nicely. The scientific point is that now you can start doing also dynamic investigations. If you can resolve five second time intervals, you can go towards interesting physiological things that, that go on when the tracer goes into the body and um, enriches there. So you don't see only the kind of saturated state of the radioactive tracer, you also start seeing the, the flow behavior. This is something we, we could do there. Okay, um, yeah, from the mathematics, you see, you have this kind of, as I said, condition that the divergence of the normal field, which is basically the mean curvature of the level lines is smooth. And you see this also when you when you reconstruct and then depending on what kind of total variation you have, isotropic or anisotropic, you would have different kinds of mean curvature. So in the regular mean curvature on the right, intuitive Euclidean one, you get very roundish things and you start rounding the edges. If you take an anisotropic um, thing, like taking the sum of the absolute value of partial derivatives, you get a, an anisotropic mean curvature, which actually favors these uh, horizontal and vertical edges. So you get very sharp corners here and start making the uh, circle a bit more round. There is, okay, this is very nice if you do uh, variational methods and you reconstruct stuff, but there is a, a remaining problem. The modeling here is, is, is quite indirect, as, as I said. I mean, you have to come up with this functional, you have to analyze stuff, and then in the end also, basically it's not a property of the functional, it's more a property of, of its subgradients or its derivatives. So it's only for the minimizers you get certain structures. If you think about Bayesian models, like what people did is taking e to the minus total variation as a kind of density for the prior, then um, this is a bit questionable from a Bayesian point of view. And even worse, there has been a lot of work in the Finnish community who showed that these priors are not um, discretization invariant. So either you get the, the mean of the posterior to converge, or you get the um, the map estimates or the variational regularization to converge, but you never get both of them really to converge in a, in a reasonable way. So there is some, some problem there. The same thing, I don't want to go into detail, happens with sparsity priors. So there you take kind of some L1 norm of some basis coefficients or some frame coefficients with different kind of formulations. Again, you get posteriors that ideally you would think of, you get something sparse, but if you look at typical samples from the related uh, 
priors that people use, they are not much more sparse than actually the priors um, that you get from a regular Gaussian model. So again, it's, it's, a, it's a property of the minimizer. It's not really sparsity in these kind of models. Then people have come up with very complicated models for sparsity priors, which are, however, not really nicely tractable in, in, a, in a high dimensional setting. So there is all kind of these problems when you want to go, for example, to uncertainty quantification and you want to have a nice basic model. Okay, so the opposite direction where we have to turn the light now. The sun is going down here. Um, so in the last years with all these boost in, in deep learning, of course, many people started to think, can we use that stuff for inverse problems? And, and the obvious idea is, okay, I just do try to do supervised learning. So I have, if I have um, pairs for inputs and outputs, so I have images and I have output data F created with some noise, I try to minimize some risk between the real images and a neural network parameterized with some parameters applied to um, the noisy data. So the neural network um, kind of is learned as a regular, as a reconstruction method. Okay, there are, however, some issues that you encounter in inverse problems. One thing is that, of course, these problems are not really small and they're really very complex from the computational point of view. So it's not actually easy to get these networks in a realistic setting to, to be trained. Then the other problem is if you look into um, the very basic analysis of generalization error in deep neural networks, they enforce a small Lipschitz constant. The better, smaller the Lipschitz constant, the better the generalization of the network will be. By definition, in an inverse problem, you have a huge Lipschitz, Lipschitz constant. And if you want to approximate that, also your neural network should have a huge Lipschitz constant. Okay, yeah. Ideal modeling of an ill posed problem, you would have an infinite Lipschitz constant of the inverse that you want to approximate. And what is also bad from a practical point of view is you don't even have usually these input output pairs because you hardly ever have ground truths that um, you can use for your data. So all the ground truths you get is again by some reconstruction method. So you could learn what other people's reconstruct, but you will not get better in most cases. The other problem is that people try is use simulated data, but simulated data always have some parts of the, of the problem that, that is not in there and will also have some problems. So one example where naturally this was tried by many people and, and where this seems very reasonable is to look in, in undersampled MR measurements and partly also in undersampled CT, but MR is of course the best because MR does not have these issues. MR reconstruction is not too complex because the forward operator is just a Fourier transform. Um, it usually has also low noise. Then also if MR is not really ill post up to the undersampling. So because the Fourier transform has a good Lipschitz constant, it's, it's an isometry. And the idea to get data pairs was to use all the MR measurements out there in the world where you took fully sampled measurements, then take only a subset of them and to use them to train a reconstruction on undersampled method. And then you get these spectacular results like in these papers here. So you see, you can go to, depending on how much quality loss you are able to accept, but typically you would say um, with these, DNN reconstructions, you might go even to 100 times uh, under sampling. So you like only use 1% of the data. So again, you measure much faster, much cheaper and so on. Okay, so in the, in the good papers, this is what people show you. And this is still 98% of the results. The puzzling thing is um, you can have strong hallucinations from your data sets. So there are two things that can happen. One thing that every MD is, is immediately concerned and sees that you don't see pathology. So things which are not in your training data set will be very difficult to reconstruct. It's just filled by, by nice structures. But even the opposite can happen. 
you can have healthy patients where such reconstructions hallucinate crazy structures, for example, in the brain. So this was something that Florian Knoll nicely provided to me. They um, did for several years now these MR reconstruction challenges where it looks like, or I mean, seemingly that what they do, they, they compare different um, learning-based reconstruction methods, but the good side for them is also they create a good database of, of examples and of images because people don't just submit their algorithms, they also submit some data. And here are some examples of structures hallucinated by a deep learning reconstruction, which are not there in the ground truth, but which not even the trained radiologists can recognize as, as being wrong. So this is something which is, I think, quite dangerous because if you have an old fashioned model-based algorithm and you do things wrong, then you will recognize typically in the reconstruction, if an experienced person looks at the reconstruction, you will always recognize that oh, there's something went wrong. With these kind of things, you just get something very nicely polished, looks like a perfect result, but it's completely hallucinated. So you have to be a bit careful on that. So there is another route that people did in order to avoid these, these issues and where many people are currently working on this. And the idea is you still solve the variational regularization or you still keep your Bayesian model, but you learn the part which is difficult to get, namely the prior or the regularizer. And there's several uh, examples that, that people came up with um, how to do this. So either you do what is called adversarial learning. So you have some good images and bad images and try to learn a functional that is small on the good ones and large on the, on the, on the bad ones. Or there is this kind of plug and play priors where people train um, basically denoising on, on images quite artificially and then use this as a, as a regularization or as a prior and then something that another generative model that can be quite um, used recently are diffusion models. So basically where you use some kind of diffusion to transform um, your data into a Gaussian and then you try to go back and bias it, the, the step back in the diffusion model to go more towards the posterior uh, there are several papers that claim they sample the posterior and in reality they do not. So this is still an interesting question how you would um, provably sample a posterior with, with a model like this. Um, I'll just show you a bit on the first one because I think it's easiest to explain. Um, this is the adversarial learning. So you have some kind of favorable images, UI, and some unfavorable ones, the, the VKs, and you kind of minimize J on the UIs and you maximize it on the VK. So J would be again some deep neural network with some parameters. And then to get the good generalization, you kind of penalize the, the Lipschitz constant or the expected Lipschitz constant of your, of your network. And then you get, well, very often some nice methods. And this is of course a sampling from an ideal problem. Um, so the ideal problem would be to have kind of the full expectation over the population risk of good images and bad images. Here you approximate that with the empirical risks. So kind of your, which is also interesting to understand from a theoretical point of view, your regularization method is kind of to be seen as a random object up to your random sampling of training data and it should converge in an ideal sense or have some generalization error to the ideal model that goes over the full popul uh, population. Okay, um, so what is, this, this gave some interesting result. What is a bit strange is also from a theoretical point of view is you don't have much control of, of what images you would favor in the end in, in a reconstruction or what uh, would come out then as a reconstruction if you use this learned regularization. So one thing 
one question I was concerned with for a while is, of course, if you say I have these good images, UI, or the full population, um, of course, somehow, if I have the right data, I should get exactly those as a solution of the inverse problem. So this training here does not use any knowledge of the inverse problem you are after. You just train blindly on images and then put it into the reconstruction as, as usual. And you don't know in the end, really, it's very difficult to analyze what comes out. So um, what we did with Supo and, and Carola was to say, OK, there's one way in a variational re reconstruction. We can uh, control that somehow nicely because we know from the optimality condition, it's like yeah, the source also called the source condition. Um, what should be a solution of an inverse problem for some data? So basically, we can characterize it if the norm of the inverse or some generalized inverse in general of the edge joint applied to the derivative or some subgradient of the regularization. Uh, is finite. So we edit this thing as a penalty for the good images. So to make sure that for appropriate data, these are really solution. And then we get this reconstruction method, which, um, yeah, in, of course, in all measures beats the, the classical methods. That's not uh, so surprising, but which has, yeah, reasonably good behavior also with respect to edges and so on. So here, this was done on an undersampled noisy CT reconstruction with a with a standard data set that is that is around. Okay, of course, one thing that is a bit a downside um, is if you compare, of course, to to other deep learning methods. Um, so, for example, if you compare to fully supervised learning, you get with these methods. Um, a slightly worse behavior in, in these error measures. And you also the images look maybe a bit more noisy still. Uh, so these two images here, the last one on top and the first one on the bottom, these are done with um, supervised learning methods. So they actually use, of course, much more data. It's not always clear. But also if you give up on some properties like the complexity of the deep neural network, oops, sorry, what happens? that you reconstruct, um, you get slightly better properties, but I don't think that the real gain from, from here to here is, is really so strong. And in the end, what happens is the main gain why the PSNR, for example, is, is much better here, appears to be due to a better reconstruction of the gray values. But the good thing is if you have a, reconstruction with the convex neural networks where we can uh, interpret everything and have robustness. We can, first of all, come up with some error estimates, which is nice. So we can really control the error. And we can also introduce other methods that we, we know from convex regularization, like the, the Bregman iteration. So this is demonstrated here on a denoising example with the same kind of networks. So if we, to the standard reconstruction here, we lose a lot of contrast. And with the Bregman iteration, we can improve a lot on those. And you see, then of course you get much better reconstructions also with these kind of structures. So you improve the structural similarity by more than 10% with the Bregman iteration. So you have everything you learned in the last years about variational regularization, you can still use also for these learning based methods. Okay. Um, if I have time, I think yeah, 10 minutes, I'll try to give you an outlook on what are the theoretical question. Um, so the common approach that people do is if it's 99% of the papers is basically um, you use a neural network for data at a fixed resolution. You use a nice data set, often a synthetic data set, and then, okay, you just, show your results and then compare with some old stupid reconstruction method. And then surprisingly, um, deep learning beats everything and is a great stuff. Okay, if you do this on more practical problems, that 
usually does not happen. There's a lot of issues that that can happen on, on real data and on uh, yeah not so nice data sets. So and it's also not clear what happens if you increase the dimension and what happens with your problem. Do you really get a, a regularization in the classical sense and so on? So very few papers like the one I, I showed here really uh, try to go a bit deeper into the theory. Um, and so there are several questions that you need to handle. One thing is you want to understand how learned methods behave in an infinite dimensional limit. As I said, for example, in modern imaging as in synchrotrons, resolution gets higher and higher. So we have naturally this question that we want to be robust with the limit number of voxels to infinity. Um, then you want to have some guarantees of robustness with respect to noise. You want to have some idea how the typical learned regularization methods look like and how typical re um, solutions look like so that you can also identify uh, possible hallucinations easily. And yeah, then you also want to, I, I presented you before three, um, three ways to train regular risers. You want to understand that. And you also want to understand um, the aspect of, of generalization. So with, if you train on only finite data, do we still get something reasonable with high probability? And so the easiest model we came up with to, to, to understand some of these questions was a very trivial neural network where we basically learn the regularization in a singular value decomposition. So the setup is as, as usual, and you probably learn in many inverse probes courses, you assume your forward operator is, is compact. You take the singular value decomposition with singular vectors un and vn, and take some simple linear additive noise model where you have an unbiased noise, and then try to look at different ways. So the first thing you can do is you can learn some of in classical regularization, a function of the singular values um, by minimizing some empirical risk. So this is again the kind of supervised learning formulation, ideally. And you try to see, you would like to understand how a method that is created from minimizing this. So you effectively you learn these coefficients here would behave or if you want to have a model for the semi-supervised learning of a regularization function, you can also keep it simple and try to use to learn a quadratic regularizer and try to learn the, which is uh, diagonal in the spectral basis because then you can do also explicit computations and see what happens. And if you do this, um, basically, okay, what we you can look at, at different things. So what we you can compare is, well, a fully supervised learning on some kind of data and noise. Uh, so solution data and noise data that you have, minimize the risk and optimize the parameters to get a fully supervised reconstruction. You could do something old fashioned that, um, well, people would not really call learning, but which goes in a similar spirit. You could use the same data to estimate a noise covariance and a noise uh, and an image covariance, kind of. And if you keep it simple, you make it diagonal in the in the singular value basis. So to see what you have, or you could look at the uh, methods that you have in in adversarial learning and this adversarial learning with this additional source condition that that we propose. So these are just four models, you can even do more, just want to, to show you what happens on those. And if you assume now uh, for simplicity that you have normalized your, your, your image data to have zero mean, then basically what will happen is since you work in this singular value basis, um, what is really important in the end is just the distribution of what I call the power spectrum. So the expected value of the singular value coefficients of the images and the expected 
value of the, the noise variances in different uh, singular value components. So if you do this, you can, well, what to do is now you can explicitly kind of compute these things and you can explicitly minimize this. And what you see is the optimal coefficients, they behave, which is not surprising, basically like in Tikhonov regularization. But, okay, this was, this was shown in the 90s. If you train with additive noise, then basically you will always get something that looks like Tikhonov regularization. Um, what is interesting is you have Tikhonov regularization with a data-driven regularization parameter and you compare here kind of the spectrum, the power spectrum of the solutions with the power spectrum of the noise. So here it depends how much noise you have in your data and how fast the solutions typically decay in the singular value decomposition. And what is interesting, if you take the Bayesian model and make this similar diagonal choice of the covariances, then, and you compute what you get, then effectively in this simple model, this will give the same. So this is one question that I think is also still uh, not answered in general. Do we really gain a lot by using deep learning and, and all these kind of things, or do we just gain a lot by using the data? So if you would do old fashioned Bayesian models, or if you would use like Gaussian mixtures or things like this, instead of all these complicated neural networks, would we get maybe reconstructions of, of similar quality if we use the same data to calibrate them? So this is something, again, which people do not compare in practice because they compare a trained model with a lot of data to something which does not use any prior data. You just use handcrafted regularizations to, to compare with. Okay, so this is, I think, uh, something that needs to, to be done. If you train a variational regularization, um, you can train the optimal regularizer, for example, by adversarial training, and then in the end, you use it to solve yeah, your usual um, regularized problem with some, um, we restricted here to an, a simple least squares fidelity, and if you then compute what would be the corresponding regularization methods, it's a, it's a long computation first to compute the optimal lambdas and then compute the solution of the uh, regularization problem. What is interesting is again, you end up with a structure that resembles Tikhonov regularization, but with a very difficult to interpret um, factor here for the adversarial learning. Whereas if you make this more interpretable method, of penalizing the source condition, then you basically end up with the same up to scaling factor, the same as you get for the supervised learning, which is of course a reference case that is interesting. Okay. Um, and then you can look, yeah, that is what, again, what, what I just said. You can look what, what are the effective conditions when do you get something in the range of the regularization, it turns out that under a typical assumption that, of course, the solutions are smoother than the noise, which means that this factor here that we have always, delta n divided by pi n, um, will go to infinity. So you regularize more than you use in standard Tikhonov regularization. So if you use data-driven reconstructions, you might easily over smooth your reconstruction. And this is something that just comes maybe from the way you learn. And this you can see already in this, um, in this very simple spectral model. Okay, and then you can compute what is the expected, for example, the expected smoothness of your reconstructions. And also there you see, you get a factor that is, well, first of all, less than one compared to the real smoothness. If you compare the power spectrum of the reconstructions to the power spectrum of the ground truth data, but then even worse, you have this factor delta divided by pi, which will go to infinity. So you, the higher frequencies you go, the more you will again over smooth. So you see it's also from this uh, thing. So what the explanation is, in a sense, is that you learn your regularization from quite rough noise potentially, and you have to make your reconstruction strong enough to deal with that noise. So this is 
why you have to uh, smooth a lot and maybe don't even get optimal results in a, in a theoretical way if you look at high frequencies. Okay, and you can look at, you know, this also from a computation point of view, there are some convergence uh, results that we could also prove for these methods then on a certain assumption if the noise goes to zero, for example. I don't show you the, the mathematical details, but just one simple um, result of the training. So if you have data here with different amount of noise, increasing amount of noise, um, then you see what happens if, if you train a, a model like this. Of course, you can get to better and better images if you if you decrease the noise. So you really have to um, you really see what you expect from this data driven model. If you take data with less and less noise, you will converge um, to the right solution. What is also interesting is if you change the noise. Um, what is maybe a bit surprising is uh, you get more and more variance in the these learned coefficients as the noise goes to zero. So it's kind of again the the regularization aspect. So if you do this in um, on undersampled data or on sampled data, then you have a stochastic effect that you see here in these learned coefficients. So the Ideal data would be probably some curve going through here. If you have stochastically sampled data, you start producing quite some variance in the in the methods that you that you learn. And there's a lot of uh, yeah theoretical questions then, of course, for real network, which we can answer in this simple model. But of course, for more complicated structures, there is a lot of of mathematics to be understood. Uh, and a lot of questions to be answered. And it's, yeah, where I want to leave you with all these open questions. Thanks a lot uh, for the attention. Thank you very much, Martin, for the very nice talk. Thank you so much. Are there any questions or comments, please? Any questions or comments, please? Please feel free to unmute yourself. Any questions or comments, please? Hello. I agree. Hi, uh, I'm Martin. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I might have missed something or misunderstood when you when you spoke about learning the covariance of the noise and covariance of the images. Uh, do you assume the knowledge of the noise level in the data you're trained from, or, or is it estimated from the training uh, data somehow? No, I mean, this is just when we generate data to... to um... No, 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 earlier, earlier than that. Yeah, so this is when we generate synthetic data, we assume we know it. But in practice, you, if you really do it in a, in a data-driven way, you don't know the... The variance of the noise. So it, basically, this um, mm -hmm. you see it from from here. Um, so it will automatically go into your reconstruction, kind of. So it's an expectation over your training set. In practice, an empirical expectation that uh, yeah you get from from your noise. The question is. One, one interesting question, of course, if you do supervised learning is you will have to, to train um, with a certain amount of noise. And then the question is, you might want to have a method and apply to the data you have in reality. And then it's not clear if you have the same amount of noise in your practical data. So we also did even then, yeah, theoretically here and, and practically for, for deep learning based things or unrolled networks, we did some studies, what happens if you apply um, a learned regularization method at, learned at some noise level to data at a different noise level. And then of course the expected things happen is that this is not op optimal. And there is a question what you want, you want to be. If you want to be um, conservative and robust, it's better to train, to be sure and train with a little bit of, of higher noise level because otherwise things can go wrong when you apply it to 
to noise level. But of course, then the reconstruction is not optimal. I think there were some methods and probably very practical with, with little theory where they uh, estimate the variance of the noise from the image or the images that, that they have. And yeah. somehow fits into the models that they learned uh, before. And that's so the amount of noise somehow enters those models. Yeah, so that's that's the the ideal way. I mean, well, the question is, is it if you have the if you would have ground truth pairs and so if you really do supervised learning, the, the noise level is there because you have really the ground truth and the noisy data. So you have the full noise, you know the full noise anyway, right? So this, this question comes more up when you do semi-supervised learning or things like this, where you don't have the, the full noise and, or you don't trust the data you have. But if you, if you have, in, in a fully supervised way, you have the full noise. So implicitly you you have already the noise level there. So it's- Yeah, but, but you don't you don't know the noise of the of the new measurement that you would be applying it to. Yeah. That, that would be a question. I mean, if you if you train, for example, from synthetic data, then of course you would typically generate things with different noise level. Maybe train and then this you can do by taking you know, the noise level as one parameter in your network, one input parameter, and then apply it to the to the data and, and then try to estimate for your data what you think is the noise level or if you know it exactly. And then it then it's then it's kind of useful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments, please? Any other questions or comments, please? If not, thank you very much, Martin, for the very nice talk. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thanks a lot.